Dear friends, a holy and happy third Sunday in Lent to one and all. How much I wish we were able to enjoy this worship experience face to face, but at the same time I am very grateful for the gifts of modern technology that allow us to share it even in this online way. Please know that my prayers are with you and yours as we navigate these trying and uncertain days, and I very much look forward to us being able to reunite as soon as possible. As many of you may know, we made an attempt at recording this yesterday, but uh, due to some technological issues, we're not able to deliver it. A small team gathered uh, yesterday afternoon, and I'm extremely grateful for that, and we will again be having small teams gather to record and deliver worship in the couple of weeks to come as we navigate this coronavirus crisis. Today, however, you are stuck with my voice alone, so I ask you to bear with me. First, let us begin as we collect our prayers with the prayer for the third Sunday in Lent. The Lord be with you, and let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading for this Sunday comes from the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people, and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. And our response to this reading is Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts, as your forebears did in the wilderness, at Meribah, and on that day at Massah, when they tempted me. They put me to the test though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter into my rest. Our God, 
gospel for this day comes from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a woman of Samaria, a drink? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the, the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you, and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. 
For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So my dear friends, as I began, I say once again how much I wish I could be sharing this moment with you directly, and I also rejoice that this technology has given us the opportunity to share it in some ways. As I noted when I had to announce our temporary suspension of public worship, Christians have over the centuries often needed to find ways to worship and pray together under very adverse circumstances. And these circumstances, far from breaking the church, consistently offer unexpected opportunities to encounter the grace of God. And so I pray that this coronavirus crisis becomes for us and for all of humanity just such a moment. As the events of the past week unfolded, I was struck by how it seemed as if Hollick's prayer and the readings for this third Sunday in Lent were tailor-made for just such a moment as this. I don't know if you noticed, but the focal point is decidedly that of water. Water is fascinating and essential stuff, isn't it? I'm an avid camper and backpacker, and every time I've been to an outdoor equipment store, Nearly all of the gear that has anything to do with water filtration or storage is manufactured by a company called First Need. I think they're overstating their case just a little bit in calling themselves First Need. In terms of our acute survival needs, air definitely comes first. But water is a close second. Without it, we would have at most a handful of days to live. And so our scriptures today center around our tenuous relationship with water. In the book of Exodus, we hear of the Israelites traveling through the wilderness, still surely harboring recent memories of their enslavement in Egypt, telling Moses that they would rather have stayed in that condition than to have come out into the thirsty and uncertain wilderness. In response to their grumbling, God provides water for them via a miracle with Moses as the intermediary. But as we hear in the psalm, this interaction provokes God to grave his pleasure. Now in the gospel, we read of Jesus holding an esoteric conversation with a woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. And again, the dialogue revolves around water. In both of these situations, the challenge to the characters involved, and by extension to all of us, is whether we can find enough faith within us to slake our thirst from an inexhaustible well, whether or not tangible water is available. Jesus refers to this inexhaustible well as a spring of water gushing up within to eternal life. The obvious question is why God would pose such a challenge to us. It's tempting to suspect that God might be toying with us creatures or simply being cruel. And if we're honest, this is not a completely unreasonable interpretation for the texts we were given today. But I don't believe that it's the correct interpretation. 
I believe God places this challenge in front of us to build us up, not to break us down. You may have heard a while ago about the water crisis in Cape Town, South Africa. Not long ago, this modern, industrialized city came within 90 short days of day zero, the day on which the public water supply would simply have dried up completely. It's hard to even imagine, not just your town, but every tap within a commutable radius gives nothing when you turn it on. Fortunately, due to some wise planning and a high degree of dedication from the public, the crisis was averted, and now the region enjoys a degree of resilience it never had prior to the crisis. But crises of, these, of this sort are brewing all over the planet, aren't they? And we're in the midst of one right now. As much as we would like to be able to take our day-to-day -day survival for granted, no such guarantee exists. Water, food, clean air, shelter, basic public health and safety are all in threatened supply all over our planet. And as droughts, fires, massive housing shortages, and now the coronavirus threat have shown us our own region is definitely not immune. And of course these crises demand action, but not all action is as helpful as it might seem. The angry or anxious activist who sees a problem or injustice and rushes right in to do something about it has existed since time unknown and is still very much around today. This is the person who, with the absolute best of intentions, rails against the mismanagement and injustice that gave rise to some existential threat, and responds by quickly reallocating resources, and in the process vilifying anyone and everyone involved in the problem's creation. Now, while this is an understandable reaction to the world's very real problems, it has a predictable effect. It simply relocates danger and poverty from one quarter to another, but it makes no progress whatsoever in truly eliminating them. The reason it has this effect is because it is immersed in a worldview of scarcity the same worldview that gave birth to these problems in the first place. It assumes that all goods, material or immaterial, are in finite supply, and there simply isn't enough for everyone. In the game of life, someone needs to lose. But my friends, what if we were to rise above this worldview into another? into a spiritual and material economy where there is ample abundance and no one needs to go without. Now this might seem kind of Pollyanna to you, it does even to me sometimes, but if I'm being Pollyanna, so is the Bible. Isn't this precisely what is at the heart of today's scriptures? Take a moment, God says, Take a moment, no matter how parched you may be, and stop worrying about finding the kind of water where after you drink it, you'll be thirsty again. Look instead for a more sublime kind of water. The kind that once it starts gushing up within you will guarantee that you never thirst again. Now, I am convinced that this spring of water of which Jesus speaks is the belief that even if every outward sign seems to be saying otherwise, God has placed us in an economy of abundance where we are enough, others are enough, and everyone can have enough without a single exception. 
With this belief firmly established in our hearts, we can face any challenge, brave any danger, face any scarcity, knowing that in the words of St. Paul, we are already more than conquerors. To put it very simply, while it is incredibly tempting to succumb to the currents of fear and anxiety as we watch something like a virus spreading across the globe, this is actually a better moment than ever to turn our complete and undivided attention to Jesus. I recognize that what I'm saying here may sound impossible, especially in times like this, the beckon of fear and despair can seem unresistible. It comes down to what we choose to feed ourselves. I urge all of us to, spend, to pay special attention in these trying days to what we feed ourselves, both literally and figuratively. Let us make it a point to limit the words of fear and panic we allow ourselves to hear, but to feast richly on God's words of comfort and hope as found in Scripture and in the mouths of encouraging friends and neighbors. Let us make it a point to limit our consumption of foods and other goods that do not genuinely nourish us, but feast richly upon clean food and pure water. Take the sacrament of the body of Christ, which I intend to deliver personally this week and in the weeks to come, to anyone who asks to receive it. And even if you're unable to receive it physically, please remember that to even desire a communion is to have received it. Even if you don't feel differently right away feeding yourself this way, I guarantee that it has a more potent effect than you can possibly imagine. It generates within you inexhaustible spring of living water that won't go away even if every other source of water dries up. I know these are difficult times and for some very frightening times. I also know that if we're able to train our attention on God and on God alone, we will discover that we truly do have everything we need. May this be our holy work, this week and in the week to come. Amen. My friends, with that, I wish you a most blessed and holy week. I will be reaching out throughout the course of this week and the weeks to come to the entire congregation. Please know that I am available for prayer and any other form of pastoral support you may need just a phone call or an email away. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always.